We're in Proverbs chapter 15, uh, Mishle in the Hebrew, and we have start, we're starting a new chapter. And uh, what I want to do today, if you look at verse 4 of chapter 15, it says, The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. I want us to, we're going to begin in verse 1 of chapter 15, but and work 1, 2, 3, and then I want us to spend some time in verse 4 in that phrase, tree of life, because there's something really, really interesting and significant about that. So let's look at verses 1 to 3, and then we will talk about that phrase, tree of life. In verse 1, a gentle answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. A... A, it's talking about how we say something and how that it can turn away wrath. The opposite of that is a, wor- a word that, uh, a, a harsh word, a word that produces pain, stirs up anger. And wrath and anger are roughly parallel there. But it's saying how we say something. In, in our time, you can send text or emails and you can't hear the tone of voice. And so there's wisdom here, I think, in, in actually what not, not to be concerned with not only what we say, but how we say it. Now, verse 2, again, talks about our speech. And throughout this book, there is a, a big emphasis on our speech and, and what we say and how we say it. Verse 2, the tongue of the wise adorns knowledge, but the mouth of the fool gushes folly. The tongue of the wise uh, adorns knowledge, uh, uh, like knowledge is attired, attired by the tongue of the wise. And so a wise person talks in well-phrased language. That would tie in with verse 1 in how you say something and language that you use it. Words mean something. And, but the mouth of a fool pours out foolishness, gushes folly, the NIV says. Verse 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. Jesus says the rain falls on the just and the unjust. And this says that God sees everything. The traditional understanding of this, which I think is probably the, the best understanding, is that there's no part of the world that God does not See, there's no part of the world that's hidden from his all-seeing eye. Just like um, uh, there's an eye watching you, the song, and also the children's song. Uh, Be careful, little hands, what you do, little lips, what you say, ears, what you hear, and eyes, what you see, because the Father up above is looking down in love. And so there's nowhere that God does not see. Now, some rabbis say, well, it's not talking about seeing the whole earth because it doesn't use the word earth. It uses the word place here. Uh, yet, uh, in, and they say what it means is that God is able through minute scrutiny uh, contrasted with what humans see. In, in every place, he's able to see that. Uh, humans on the other side can generalize something. They may not have all the details. But um, it's saying that God's sees everything and God sees us. And that can be a comforting thought or it can be a terrifying thought that God sees us and God sees everything. The psalmist in 139 says, where can I go to to, uh, uh, be away from your presence? And it's comforting to him. Now we come to verse four. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. And so we're back again to the idea of, of a tongue. Now, this uh, phrase, tree of life, occurs in three books of the Bible, two in the Hebrew Scriptures and one in the New Testament. And uh, you, I'm, I'm sure you know the first place is in the very first book of the Bible, in Genesis. And then the last place is in the very last book of the Bible, Revelation. And so we have tree of life, and then we have... It's in Proverbs. Three times in Genesis, three times in Revelation, and four times in Proverbs. And we go back there to Genesis. The uh, commentators note that the idea of something giving life like that, a tree, or uh, would be known to, to ancient people. Uh, there are plants that give life, bread, and, 
and so on and water in some of the ancient epics and myths and i'm not saying genesis is an is a myth but the most famous one uh babylonian myth is the epic of gilgamesh and it, it talks about uh, the noah of that story his name um is a long name utnapishtim and he is telling gilgamesh and he tells him about a magical plant that gives life it's at the bottom of the sea and he says if your hands obtain that plant you will find new life and so gilgamesh goes deep sea diving and he secures that plant and he has the guy that's running the boat uh, guiding the boat and gilgamesh says here's the plant and i named this plant its name shall be man becomes young in old age I myself shall eat it and return to the state of my youth. Now, it, it didn't work out for him in the epic because he, um, he was taking a bath in a, in a river and he placed the plant down beside the bank of the river and as he's taking a bath, he sees a serpent come up and steal the plant. And so he lost the, the life there and the eternal life, the life that this plant gives. And so the concept of a tree that gives life in the Garden of Eden wouldn't have been something that would be strange uh, to Israel. So the three occurrences, three in Genesis, three in Revelation, and four in Proverbs. And some suggest the structure here is uh, chiastic or like a sandwich. You have bread on one end, bread on the other end, and meat or whatever in the middle of the sandwich. The tree of life in all of its uses then and its application in Proverbs, it's sandwiched between three eternal mentions on either side of it. So heaven and earth intersect in Proverbs, this tree of life. And we said before, Proverbs is a very practical book. It's a down-to-earth book. And so <clears throat> that's instructive to us, I think, that this tree of life in Genesis that will be reclaimed in Revelation is now found in the way that God's people live in this world. Uh, one person said the eternity that uh, in the beginning, in Genesis, in the garden, will pass through Proverbs to the other side in Revelation eternity. So let's go and read these passages. Uh, let's go back to Genesis and we'll go back to chapter 2. And is in um, first of all, it, it says that um, that God we, we have trees, trees, trees in the passage that leads up to the tree of life. In Genesis chapter two and verse nine, it, after there's a garden and he put man in the garden verse 9 the Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food and then in the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil so we have a lot of trees but then two are mentioned the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil the next occurrence of that, and you know how God commanded these humans, don't eat of that tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And they did, and so they forfeited their right to the tree of life. And we're told that in chapter 3 of Genesis. So the first occurrence is chapter 2 and verse 9. And then the second occurrence in Genesis is in chapter 3 and verse 22. And this is after the fall, after they disobeyed God. And it says, And the Lord God said, The man has become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So there's the second occurrence of this. And the last occurrence in Genesis of this phrase, tree of life, in the Hebrew it's eitz kayim is in the last verse of chapter 3, 324. After he, that's God, drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim, cherubim, 
and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. And so humans are now, the, the, the man and woman are cast out of this park-like setting, this, this garden that's filled with all these trees and specifically two trees, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and then the tree of life. And it's, the, it's taught humans should not have disobeyed God by eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. By doing that, they are banished absolutely. It's setting up, uh, setting up tension here. Banished absolutely from the tree of life. And that, that tension is there throughout Scripture and it's finally resolved in Christ who's able to re, re, uh, reclaim that life and give us that life. Though believers in, in him can now have this tree of life. So that's Genesis. Now the three occurrences in Genesis and then there are four occurrences in Proverbs. So let's go and read those. Pro, the first one, well before we go there, uh, go to 1 Kings. <clears throat> Pro, uh, Solomon wrote many Proverbs, and he also collected many Proverbs, and God gave him wisdom. You remember that? And we're told uh, what, Pro what Solomon spoke and what he taught in 1 Kings chapter 4. And it says in verse 32 that he spoke 3,000 Proverbs, and his songs numbered 1,005. And then we're told he spoke about plant life from the cedar of Lebanon, to the hyssop that grows out of the walls. So the cedar of Lebanon is tree, uh, the trees. And so he spoke of plants, he spoke of trees. He also spoke about animals and birds, reptile and fish. From all nations, people came to listen to Solomon's wisdom, sent by all the kings of the world who had heard of his wisdom. So it's interesting, isn't it, that that tells us there that he spoke about trees in these Proverbs and also in, in giving wisdom. Now let's go to the book of Proverbs and we're going to see the four occurrences that are there. And the first one is found in Proverbs chapter 3. And throughout this we're going to see that this is used in a figurative way and it's referring to wisdom and how that when people act in wisdom <clears throat> they're showing this tree of life. The first occurrence is chapter 3 and verse 18 and it's talking about wisdom and it says she is a tree of life to those who take hold of her those who hold her fast will be blessed then the next occurrence is in chapter 11 and verse 30 and it says the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life the fruit of the righteous, I think, is the life that they, they live, and it's a tree of life. <clears throat> and then the second phrase there, and we talked about what that might mean in, in the video on that section. So uh, you'll have to go back there and, and rewatch that, but uh, it's translated, I think, in the King James, wins souls, but uh, the NIV has here, the one who is wise saves lives. But how we understand that phrase, we had the phrase, that the tree of life, the fruit of the righteous, is a tree of life. Then the last occurrence, or the uh, third occurrence, is in, we have four in Proverbs, is in chapter 13, <clears throat> in verse 12. Hope deferred makes the heart sick, but a longing fulfilled is a tree of life. When a desire comes, when it's fulfilled, it's a tree of life. And then the last reference in Proverbs is in the one that we read there in 15.4. The soothing tongue is a tree of life, but a perverse tongue crushes the spirit. So in Proverbs, this idea of the tree of life is a personification, a symbolic representation of the concept of, of wisdom, how that wisdom works itself out in, in our lives. The uh, rabbinic literature, the rabbis were really interested in this phrase, the tree of life. They gave a graphic commentary of how large the tree was. 
Uh, it spread out over all living things, they said. And uh, one rabbi said it was so large that it took 500 years to encircle the tree. It's a 500-year journey to get from one side of the tree uh, back around. Uh, some have suggested, and of course that's symbolic language, some have suggested that they use that, uh, to em that symbolic language to emphasize how central, how important this tree of life really is. A midrash, a Jewish midrash, understands the manna as coming from the tree of life, the manna that God uh, fed the Israelites. Uh, Jewish rabbis suggest that the menorah, the uh, lamp stand in the tabernacle and also in the temple, it's seven branches of that, just, which looks like a tree. <clears throat> that the tree, that the background of that is the tree of life. But usually the rabbis connect the phrase tree of life to a study of Torah. And the, one rabbi said the Torah is a tree of life to all who study in it. And those who guard its commandments will live and rise up like a tree of life in the world to come. And so we have this in Proverbs, it's symbolic, it's a personification, and it's not really far-fetched to, to uh, suggest that, that Torah is the tree of life, and you have that working out in wisdom, because wisdom is related to Torah as well, God's teaching. Now let's look at the three references in Revelation. And so we've, looked, we've seen three in Genesis, four in Proverbs, and there are three in Revelation. And the first one is found in chapter 2 of Revelation. In chapters 2 and 3, of course, we have these letters from Christ himself. He's pictured in chapter 1 of Revelation, and then he's sending these letters to these seven churches. And in Revelation chapter 2, uh, he is to the church of Ephesus, walking among the seven lampstands, golden lampstands. And then each of these letters follows a pattern. And at the end of each letter, it's uh, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. And so verse 7 of Revelation 2, whoever has ears, let, him, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who is victorious, I will give the right to eat from the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. And that's echoing what we're told in Genesis. This paradise of God is, uh, it seems, Eden is reclaimed, a return to Eden. So that's the first reference in Revelation. The second reference in Revelation, and the second and third reference in Revelation is found in the last chapter. So go over there to Revelation chapter 22. And in verse 2, it says, and this is when John uh, sees New Jerusalem, new heavens, new earth. And then it says in verse 1, the angel of chapter 22, the angel showed me this river of the water of life. It's clear as crystal. Flows from the throne of God and of the Lamb down the middle of the great street of the city. On each side of the river stood the tree of life, bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month. And the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. And then the last reference to the tree of life is in verse 14 of Revelation 22, one of the uh, seven Beatitudes in Revelation. Blessed or blessed are those who wash their robes that they may have the right to the tree of life and may go through the gates into the city. Now, there are some parallels between Revelation and Genesis about this tree of life. And I want to, uh, uh, next week we'll, we'll spend a few minutes at the beginning. I want to spend uh, in summing this up and looking at that. But today, at least I want us to, to read and to hear the three references to tree of life in Genesis, the four in Proverbs, and the three in Revelation. And so you have uh, Paradise Lost, Paradise Regained, but the Tree of Life passes through this very down-to-earth book of Proverbs. And so that, in a sense, has, has uh, impacted our life now if we are believers. 
It's uh, like many theologians put it, the already, but the not yet. Let's close with a prayer. Dear Father, we bow before you with humility. We thank you for this study. We thank you for uh, this, these references to the tree of life. <clears throat> and Father, we are thankful, Father, that uh, in your great love, you sent Christ to be our Savior and that we might have life reclaimed, that we might have life in him. And we're longing for the time, Father, when we will be around your throne and around the throne of the Lamb, when all things will be made new. And there will be no sin, no suffering, no sickness, and we will praise you forever. Uh, we pray, Father, <clears throat> for those who are hurting. We pray for those who are struggling with sickness. We pray, Father, for those who are, who are mourning uh, the loss of loved ones, the death of loved ones. And we pray you give them strength, uh, give them um, comfort during this difficult time. We pray that you be with our our congregations be with your church and we know father that you're active and walking among your congregations uh, help us to uh, be bold and help us to be courageous but help us also to be loving we pray for our nation we pray you'll be with our president we pray that he will uh, listen to you and we pray that he will guide us from principles that are uh, in harmony with your word uh, we pray for the nations of the world. We pray above all, Father, that we, we will give you glory and praise and honor. Forgive us of our sins. Go with us. And we're longing for the time, Father, when we will be in your presence, praising you uh, forever. And these things we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.